I'm going to start and just uh, remind people a little bit uh, uh, of what DNA is. DNA is the hard drive, the memory in every cell of every living organism that has the instructions for how to make that cell. But it's a chemical molecule. It's not magic. It's not special. Uh, it's, it's, in fact, four different kinds of molecules that can be stuck together in a chain, a larger molecule that is a chain. And you can put those four in any order. Uh, and if you can read that back, you, you have a sequence of, of characters, uh, if you want to think of it like a digital code. You can see on the right is a little representation of what those four molecules are. Uh, in the middle, the famous double helix structure that nature uses to, to store a sequence of them stably in every cell. But if you read out the information that's there, it's just like a ticker tape of letters, each one being one of the four possibilities. And there's three billion of those, and, and that mere three billion letters defines your genome and all the instructions to make a living human or a living ant or yeast or, or any uh, organism you can imagine. It's sort of like this, but it's incredibly small. We have a big data revolution in genomics, uh, and this, this next slide illustrates why that's happened. Ten years ago, the cost of sequencing a genome of one person or one living organism was about the same as the price of this, which is famously the most expensive house in London. And ten years later, the cost of sequencing that one genome was the price of this, which is a season ticket to see Arsenal Football Club, which is one of the top UK clubs, and in another 10 years, you know, the cost will be the cost of going to watch one terrible club play one game. <laughs> so the price is, is plummeting, and so scientists are very excited, and they do more and more genome sequencing. And then after they've done that, and they've done their experiments, they want to keep the data safe, and unfortunately, that's where my job comes into it, because they send that data via the internet to my institute, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and they ask us to store that information. So we, our PR people give me a picture of a mountain and a graph, and I don't even know which graph it is, because all our graphs just go up exponentially. <laughs> uh, so that, that's one of the databases, or maybe all of the databases. We have a 60 petabyte uh, storage system now that, that we're filling up. It's, it's nearly full. And that gives us a bit of a headache on to how we go about storing that data because our budget does not go up exponentially. Um, but if you'd like to put pressure on someone you know to give us more funding, please do. So we buy more and more computer servers and more and more hard disk drives to store this information. And we have headaches doing this. How do you capture exponentially increasing data uh, and serve it back to the whole world on a essentially flat budget. Why do you store this data? Do people really care? Well, people really do care, and we just have a little live demo. What we have here, this is in real time showing you the hits on our website. We have about 100 times more hits on our website than CERN does on theirs. This is the people in real time using the website. If anyone's got a smartphone and they're quick, hit this QR code or that URL there, and if we're lucky, we'll see Davos light up. I don't know if that will work. Probably uh, your phones might not be registered as appearing in Davos. Uh, but we get you know, thousands of hits a minute, millions of hits a month. One thing we realized is that all, all this information we're storing, you know, it's, it's about DNA, but the DNA we're storing information about is a digital storage medium. It's a sequence of, well, not zeros and ones like in your computers and smartphones, but a sequence of a discrete alphabet of four letters and if we could manipulate the, some DNA, we could put a message in there ourselves, and we could use DNA to store it. DNA is a really good way of storing information. It's been used for, for, for hundreds of millions of years on, on life on Earth, evolving, has used that as its hard disk drive. Maybe we could use that. So we devised an experiment to see if this was a feasible way of archiving and storing information. One of the things we needed to do was decide what information to store uh, and, um, and what kind of code to use. So we had to invent a code that would store information. We didn't just want to store information about genes and processes in a living body. We wanted to store any kind of digital information, just as your computer and your phone and your iPod can do. There's various problems we had to overcome. We can't make very long pieces of DNA as humans yet. Uh, so we had to invent a code that could make a message out of many short fragments of DNA. We had to devise a code that could store any information. We had to be aware of uh, problems that would come and errors that might occur in the writing or the reading of that information, just like digital TV transmission or mobile phones have error correction in them. So we devised a code that would do that. Uh, we picked some bits of informa some information to store, and we thought, what would be high-value information you'd want to store a long time in a DNA format? Maybe the, the poem, The Sonnets of William Shakespeare, 154 sonnets. Uh, as a text file, we... Um, 
put, uh, actually not the picture of Martin Luther King, but an uh, 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 excerpt from his I Have a Dream speech, which I hope... So I want to emphasize not, not a transcript of what he said, the actual recording of what he said in an MP3 format um, recorded into our DNA code, written into pieces of DNA. Because we're molecular biologists at heart, uh, a PDF copy of the Watson and Crick uh, paper from 1953 describing the, the helix structure of DNA uh, in living cells. And we encoded those uh, and we had that made into DNA uh, by, by the Agilent Company in California. Uh, and it came in a test tube exactly like that one. It, it wasn't nearly full. In fact, when it arrived, on my, and my, I opened the box up and I held it up and I thought something had gone wrong because it was empty. And my more skilled molecular biology friends had to explain to me that that tiny smudge of dry dust sticking to the bottom of the tube was the actual DNA. And it was a tiny, tiny speck. If the whole thing was full, we would have um, a petabyte of information in there. And that's hard to imagine what something the size of your finger with a petabyte of information is. So in other terms, I, I, I've just paced out the size of the stage. And by my calculations, if you laid out CD-ROMs all over the stage, you'd get about a thousand of them on here. If you did that a thousand deep, so it'd be up to about here somewhere, this whole stage, this deep in CDs, right, that's a petabyte. So you can either have that much information stored in that format or something the size of your finger in DNA. So it's really compact. That's why earlier on I reminded you that DNA is very small. And we devised our entire experiment from information on the top left on my computer, my laptop computer. We sent that to Agilent in California. They synthesized the DNA for us. They sent it back by courier. Thank you, FedEx. Came back. It came back to us in Cambridge. We did a bit of purification. In fact, it went over to our German laboratories because that's where we have our sequencing facility. It was read in a DNA sequencing machine exactly the same as used for human genomics or, or any genomics experiments around the world. And we recreated the computer files back on my laptop. Uh, and it doesn't make for a very good image, but they come out exactly the same. They weren't just similar. Every single bit, every single zero and every one was correctly reproduced. So we have essentially a proof of principle that we don't just have to marvel at the way nature has evolved a system for storing information in DNA in every living being, but we can use a very similar kind of system uh, and use the same chemical molecule that's so good for storing information. I have a few sciencey bits, but I'm always warned, like Stephen Hawking said, have, have no equations and I should probably have no graphs, but I, I can't resist. We did various studies in order to get our scientific paper published. What I'm showing on the left that I don't expect anyone to fully understand in the one minute I'm going to devote to it is the fact that um, for, for the size of our experiment, our coding system is reasonably efficient uh, and works quite well. As you store more and more information, there's some technical issues you have to deal with about how you reconstitute that information, and it gets marginally less efficient. And we were asked, would it still be viable to larger amounts of data? And what we showed is that from our experiment, which is sort of on the left-hand side of the graph, over to all the information on any device on the entirety of planet Earth, we're still pretty efficient. That's what the three zettabytes data point represents. And we remain adequately efficient, even up to many, many orders of magnitude more information. So basically, it does scale up quite well. But if you want an easier image uh, to take home with you, you could get all the information in the whole world encoded in a DNA format in the back of one, and for Americans, in one SUV, and for the English, in the back of one estate car. So, so you don't need many, many data centers all over the world. All that much information, in principle, would fit in one vehicle. Can we get the information back out? Well, we, we can do that. That's pretty efficient. That's what this, this, this revolution in DNA sequencing technology that's brought you the season ticket priced genome has brought. I have actually the, the latest devices um, look like that. Actually, I have a slightly more up-to-date one here that can go around the room. This device could sequence, well, they're sort of, they're in beta testing at the moment, but within months, people will be able to sequence a whole genome in, in a day or so. I'm very happy for this to go around the room, but I, I do need it to come back to me at the end. The one on the screen has a USB plug, um, which would plug straight into your computer, and they had to admit they couldn't actually design that. Um, 
but it does come with a USB cable <laughs> to plug it directly into your computer or maybe your smartphone. We can read DNA sequences back pretty quickly. That's not the problem. We can make lots and lots of copies of them. That's really easy. It's, it's actually better than a photocopier. A photocopier, you have to run it once every time you want to wait one more copy. Copying DNA is really easy and it works exponentially quickly. You start with one and you make two copies. From those two, you can make four. And you don't need a different machine for every one of those. It's just one very standard piece of laboratory equipment can very rapidly um, grow exponentially many copies of what you started with. So copying it is not the problem. Once I have my message, I can distribute it to all of you very easily. But writing that in the first place is very difficult. Humans are not good yet at writing the first new copy of DNA. Once we have one, we can make more copies of it. But making that first one is difficult. This is, a, this is Agilent's facility in, in Palo Alto. They need a clean room. They need a very, very complicated machine, a bit like a, a laser, uh, an inkjet printer but more complicated, and it's slow, and it takes a while. This is very much the rate-limiting step in the procedure we're working on with at the moment. Um, it takes too long, and it's very expensive. So the idea of having all the information in the back of one vehicle, uh, it, 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 there isn't enough money on Earth at the moment to do that. So I want to finish off with some ideas about why this is a good thing to do. And depending on your age, you will recognize or not recognize some of these. But what they illustrate is a whole bunch of digital media, or potentially digital media, that have been used. I have used every single one of these. If you've got any of these things lying around in your house or your office or in your garage or whatever, um, you won't be able to read them anymore. I'm pretty sure about that. Within a few years, these things become obsolete. And that's a problem if you're trying to do long-term archiving. I would argue that no one on the Earth is currently long-term archiving digital information. Yet most information is now being created digitally. Currently, it's stored digitally. It's, it's observed, looked at on your screen digitally. But we can't archive that information. Some things only exist in a digital form. Movie companies do things entirely digitally now. They shoot things digitally. They mix it all up digitally. They do different versions for, on the aeroplane or the 3D movie or the 2D version of the movie. Everything is, they show it in the movie cinema digitally. When they want to make an archive copy, then they make an analog celluloid copy because they know how to do it. That's not a good way to go. But if we go through any, you know, how long will hard disks work? How long will memory sticks work for? How long will DNA work for? It works a very long time. How do we know that? We've done the experiment. We've looked at mammoth DNA that's 20,000 years old. Neanderthal DNA is 40,000 years old. Uh, the bison is 60,000. The current record is ancient horses. 700,000-year-old DNA sequences have been successfully read from samples found. That wasn't even a carefully done experiment. That was a dead horse that, that lay there somewhere cold. If you do something careful with it, you can make the DNA last much longer. We have the facility already, essentially. You don't, it's not difficult. It's not complicated. All you need is somewhere that's cold and dark and dry. Uh, and even those aren't entirely necessary, but they're the best conditions. The global seed vault in Svalbard in Norway already exists. What they actually store there is seeds, but this is a facility. It costs almost nothing to run. There are no staff there. It's in the Arctic Circle. As long as you shut the door, it's dark in there. It's freezing cold. It keeps it dry. We already, it's very cheap to run a facility that can store this kind of information. If you want to do it yourself, your refrigerator is just perfect. And if you're really conservative, your freezer is just perfect. Will we have a technology to read it back? Well, we will, because it's DNA. As long as we have humans who are technologically advanced, we will be able to read DNA. We're changing the machine every year or two as the technology improves so much. But they can all do the same thing. They can all read DNA. As long as there are people, there will be DNA readers. The same is not true of a floppy disk drive or probably a USB memory stick. What are we going to store in the long term? Well, it's very expensive. So if it's very expensive and it's going to last a very long time, you're going to start off with things that have a very high value. Maybe the, the presidential records in the US perhaps are considered to have very high, uh, high value or information about where nuclear waste has been dumped. That's really important to keep that information safe for a long time in a format where anyone can read it back. But as the technology gets cheaper, what do you and I think? When, it, when it's down to a few dollars, maybe your family photographs or something, you would spend a little bit of money to have in a really safe format, it's put somewhere out of harm's way where you know that future generations will for sure be able to read it back. I'm just gonna finish off by thinking on a little bit further. Uh, money is, is, is digital information these days. This is, this is 
actually not a real coin, that's a pretend Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is a form of money um, that now really only exists on computers uh, and with cryptography. That's something we can easily store in DNA. And I wanted everyone to be able to go home with a real reminder of what I've been talking about today. My kind assistants are going to come amongst you now. I'm going to finish speaking. Uh, what we have done is we have bought a Bitcoin and we have encoded the information of that Bitcoin into DNA. Please take one home. Uh, if you follow the link that's here, you can get a pointer to a web page that describes our project. It gives you a pointer to the technical description of the encoding method we've used. A DNA sequencer at the moment, you know, you, you don't need to own your own. They, you can send it off to commercial services to do the sequencing for you. Whoever gets there first and decodes it, the Bitcoin is yours for the taking. The first person can claim it for theirs. Once someone's sweep, swept it up, then it's not available to anyone else. So yes, it is a race. Um, Good luck with that. I'm going to finish there. Um, thank you very much for listening. So today, we obviously live at the height of the information age. And computers have had innumerable and uh, unpredicted effects on uh, people's lives. Now, uh, the key to this digital revolution is that any information can be simply represented as a collection of bits. With the advent of Moore's law, there's been an exponential expansion in our ability to store and manipulate those bits. This progression, where computing power doubles every 18 months, has been driven by the successive miniaturization of transistors and integrated circuits. But this can't go on forever, right? Because now we're reaching the point where many parts of a transistor are just a few atoms across. And this is a problem because, like it or not, we're entering the quantum world. Quantum mechanics was one of the biggest scientific surprises of the 20th century. Its new rules were so unexpected, we still sometimes call them weird or counterintuitive. Quantum computing is a new paradigm that seeks to exploit just these rules to process information in a completely different way. The basic idea is to replace the bits of a typical computer, which are either zero or one, with some quantum object, a qubit, that we can program information into its quantum states. Now, unlike a regular bit, a quantum bit can be placed in a superposition. Like Schrodinger's famous cat that's both alive and dead at the same time, a quantum bit can store both a zero and a one at the same time. Now, this idea gives quantum computers, we think, a kind of parallelism that allows them to store massive amounts of information and accomplish otherwise impossible computing tasks. For instance, uh, a computer containing just 200 qubits would store more than 10 to the 60 bits of classical information. So how are we going to build a quantum computer? Uh, again, anything like an atom can serve as our quantum bits, but it's hard to see how to wire up individual atoms into something with the complexity of uh, today's computers. At Yale, my colleagues and I are developing electrical devices that can serve as simple quantum bits. So using uh, circuits composed entirely of superconductors and working at temperatures near absolute zero, we and others have succeeded in designing uh, electrical devices whose quantum states can be programmed uh, from the outside. And this technology has advanced rapidly to the point where we can actually perform a simple quantum calculation. So here's a little trick we did with this two qubit device that actually shows a quantum speed up. If I have a database with four locations and I'm looking for the special one with the only red card, at, uh, classically I have to search randomly and it will take several tries. But our quantum device could find the answer in a single go. So, so far, uh, the main limitation on this technology has been the fragility of quantum information. Our quantum bits tend to forget. Uh, but there's been exponential progress in the performance of these devices. In the 15 years since uh, they've existed, we've seen over a million-fold improvement in the lifetime they can store information. And now it's reached the point where we think we can actually scale up. So where are we now, and what might a quantum computer actually be used for? If we look back at the history of conventional computing, it evolved through several phases, and the uses of computers evolved as well. Early on, all the applications were scientific or military, and it wasn't until Moore's law and the explosion of computing power that most of the current uses were even imagined. So our hope is that with quantum computing, there'll be a similar kind of an evolution. 
So today, perhaps we're at the analogous point that computing was in the 1950s. We have examples of a few working quantum transistors. Next, we need to devise the quantum version of the integrated circuit and master quantum complexity on a vast scale. So to avoid the accumulation of even tiny errors, uh, we think it's going to be very hard to build a real computer. Uh, we need to build lots and lots of redundancy. Getting this trick, which is called quantum error correction, to work is the biggest outstanding scientific uh, challenge today. So the discipline of quantum computer science, because we don't yet have the hardware, is still in its infancy. Uh, but what we already know about the applications are very tantalizing. So uh, a quantum computer is exponentially good at solving quantum problems, like simulating the properties of a new molecule or a new material. A quantum computer might also help us devise a catalyst to sequester CO2 from the environment, uh, or even perhaps to teach computers to be better at pattern recognition. Now, of course, as with the early stages of conventional computing, one of the biggest drivers so far has been its potential for breaking other people's codes. Now, paradoxically, it may be that quantum information and quantum mechanics can actually help ensure everyone's privacy. So quantum information has a special property in that it can never be copied. And this allows, we think, new kinds of secure communications that can't be eavesdropped. And finally, as with any radically new technology, we should expect that the best applications of quantum computers won't be known until we can actually build one. So obviously we live in the information age and everyone knows that a great deal of our energy resources and the power that we generate has got to go into maintaining computations and this also includes data storage. So of course data storage and computations always go hand in hand and there is some staggering statistics that, uh, that I've uh, read about recently. For example, companies like uh, Google if you think in terms of their energy expenditure, um, are comparable to the whole of the airline industry. So the heat they generate simply because they have to, they have to store large memories. In fact, the US uh, government spends 3% of their energy on exactly the same problem, on data storage. And this has severe environmental implications simply because every time you compute, you heat up and you generate heat in the atmosphere. And as you've seen from the other talks, this is, of course, a big, a big problem. The question I'll be asking is, is there anything we can do to make the number crunching more efficient in terms of energy expenditure? So this is a huge problem. There is a multitude of problems. One of them is, what are the physical limitations to that? What are the, physics, the laws of physics telling us about how low we can go in terms of energy expenditure? On the other hand, I think the question that we are asking within this session is if we manage to reduce our energy expenditure based on our understanding of physics, what kind of impact would that have on our environment? And this would be, of course, extremely helpful to us as well. Now, we have the latest evidence from the experiments in the laboratory that nature is much more effective at information processing. Photosynthesis is one famous example where there is a nanowire whose quantum efficiency is almost 100%, certainly bigger than anything we can do artificially in our labs. The other interesting example is the DNA, where you can think of the base pairing inside the DNA as a basic computational step, in which case this uh, replication is 10,000 times more effective in terms of energy expenditure than the best computer that we have. And this is really interesting. So the question is, can we learn anything from this. The basic issue why computers heat up when they calculate is because they are irreversible. When you do something and when you have to undo it, it generates a lot of friction and this friction manifests itself as heat. So irreversibility here is the key issue. The way to make it reversible, and this is my two slides on quantum mechanics, that's all you're going to hear about it, is that quantum uh, mechanics is unusual in the sense that all quantum processes are fully reversible, and that's because all particles are really like waves. And I think the next slide will illustrate to you, if you think of a computational step as taking one of the two alternatives, like in this slide, 
then a quantum system can actually go down both of these lanes simultaneously. And it's this that makes the whole thing efficient in terms of energy expenditure. Classically, you'd have to make a choice. You'd have to go left or right, which actually results in expanding heat. So that's the key issue. So the, the issue that we'll be asking and addressing within my session is how can we learn from the natural systems like the photosynthesis, like the DNA, and make our own energy processing more effective. And there is even more examples uh, on this, which are birds that use quantum mechanical systems to actually navigate properly. This is a genuine, uh, genuine uh, quantum mechanical process, and it's the only uh, paper I've got in the Daily Mail, by the way, coming out of my research, which is also interesting. The key message, ultimately, is that even a little bit of saving in terms of reversibility could give us a huge benefit. And that seems to be the route that nature is taking. Most of the natural processes are actually classical. But in the bottleneck where it matters, they become quantum mechanical. And it's a hybrid quantum and classical system, which is really what this picture is meant to, meant to illustrate. And in fact, even a little bit of uh, efficiency could really make the difference between life and death in natural systems. We have these bacteria that live only on a, on a few photon diet a day. And the question is, how do they do it? How quantum mechanical is that? Is it quantum mechanical, really? As Ian said earlier, I run a consor consortium with a bunch of eggheads addressing these and similar issues. And what I'll be asking in my session is exactly here. How can we learn from nature to do more efficient computation? Thank you. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm Joe Palka, uh, and I'll be moderating this session. The session is called Beyond Moore's Law. Oh, a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have a cell phone, please put it on silent. And we're using a hashtag for this uh, session, which means that if you put this into your Twitter tweet, it will pop up on a screen. And if it's reasonably coherent, it will be passed on to me. And I'll read it off the screen if I don't screw it up, which I have done. Um, so what we're going to talk about, so the topic is beyond Moore's Law. The two people who are speaking are Konstantin Novoselov, to my left. He's a research fellow in Mesoscopic Physics Research Group, University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, right? And to his left is Robert Shulkoff, Sterling Professor of Applied Physics and Physics at Yale University in America. Now, we titled this session Beyond Moore's Law. And first, I'm assuming that most of the people in this room know what Moore's Law is. But as Robert explained to me earlier, it's a law po po postulated by Gordon Moore 50 years ago that basically said, or that su suggested that the density of information that could be packed on a silicon chip was basically going to double for every 18 months up to a certain point. Now, the up to the certain point is a, is a question mark because at some point you run into the physical limits of the, the amount you can pack onto a chip and you start running into things that no longer follow the seemingly clear-cut laws of physics and they dive into these weirder laws of physics which Robert will talk a little bit about. So the thing is, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about when Moore's Law is going to be reached. We're not going to talk about why it's coming soon or late. That's not what the topic is. We just know it's coming, and there's going to have to be something to come after that. And there are a multitude of approaches to what we're going to do to continue this incredible run we've been on of packing information into small and processing into smaller and smaller uh, devices. And there are a lot of approaches, but we're going to talk about two of them, as represented by Kostya and Rob. And Kostya, as you probably all know, is an expert in graphene, which, for which he and Mr. Keim, Andrew Keim, right, um, won the Nobel Prize in 2010. And Rob's Nobel Prize still hasn't been awarded, but we can expect that in any time. Um, uh, but he's been working on uh, quantum computing. So that's where we are. And I think I'll just start by saying to you, Kostya, what what do you see? What part of the future uh, excites you, and what role might graphene play in it? Well, just to say first that uh, although I've been 
working, I, I started to work on graphene 2004 probably. Currently only 20% of my time is on graphene itself. And uh, since then we expanded into many other two-dimensional crystals, many other materials which are only one atom thin. And depending on the particular application in, um, in electronics or in, um, com in computing, you would like to use one or another material for uh, different applications. Or uh, what is even more exciting is the combination of many materials, because then you, you can create something which is called heterostructures, where you combine different properties of different materials and in, in a combination which, that, which won't be available to you from Mother Nature and then you can achieve uh, com completely novel multi multifunctional properties, multifunctional <laughs> applications from, uh, from those. So I can um, probably talk about on okay, well, any first, of those. First maybe you could talk about why there was so much excitement around a, a sheet of atoms a sheet that was one atom thick, essentially, right. a 2D crystal. Well, uh, first of all, it, most of the excitement came with graphene itself. And uh, the first excitement and the, the major excitement for me is that is the two-dimensional material, one atom thick. And uh, if you would ask me 10 years ago, can you make one atom thick fabric I would say probably not. Just all the all the experience, previous experience tells you that it should decompose. It shouldn't be stable. That one was uh, particularly stable, extremely stable, and that's if that is not not enough, we have very new, very unusual properties for electrons, for quasi particles, which uh, which which transfer. Uh, electrical current in that in that uh, in in this material they mimic um, quasi relativistic Dirac uh, Dirac fermions I won't go into well, thank you. into details thank you. but it's something very very unusual for uh, electronics or for condensed metaphysics but then you have you have new you have lots of new opportunities and of course, then it, it turns out that this material is extremely strong. It's impermeable to anything, extremely stretchable, and so on. So that was uh, for some time. Uh, and, but then we figured it out that there are an, uh, a whole class of those materials, which are only one atom thick. And surprisingly, their properties are often very different from the properties of their three-dimensional precursors, from their three-dimensional counterparts. And exploring those properties is something very exciting for a physicist. You know, superconductivity in two, in two dimensions, very, very interesting ferromagnetism in, in two dimensions, and so on. And on top of that, the recent topic which we start to explore now is bringing all those crystals into heterostructures. And then we design a material on, on atomic level, we can encode different properties in, into this three-dimensional stack, and then um, we we'll call it material on demand. You tell us which properties do you want, we can give it. We can give it to you from the stack. It's um, it's okay. it's like uh, if you if you compare it to modern electronics to silicon, what we have now is a material which practically. Which is which is electronics now silicon, and then on top of that we build a structure. We cut it, we etch it, we put contacts, we evaporate gates. On top of that we create structure which has the functionality. Uh, uh, what we are trying to do is to build materials with the functionality already built on the materials level, rather than on the structural level. So you have material which can which carry some information, some, stru some functions in it or already. So it's a different paradigm, if you want. Right. Is there a, a, a reasonably simple answer to the question? The simple answer is, how do these new um, heterostructures that you're making solve the problem that is caused by the silicon right. three-dimensional structure? Now, it's. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, and you, uh, I'm, 
I'm probably the, the wrong person to answer this because there is a roadmap and mm -hmm. this, this more, Moore's law determines this roadmap, mm -hmm. where do we want to be? And if you want me to answer from physics perspective, then yes, we can. Uh, one, of the one, one of the transitional points for modern electronics will be to switch from the planar arrangement of our transistors because currently what we're using, we have the silicon wafer and we are using the planar arrangement, just uh, those transistors situated next to, to each other. We can switch to vertical arrangements and then it would bring clear benefits. For example, your the length of your transistor, the, the effective length, we can make it into few atomic layers rather than 20 nanometer now as we've got, as we've got at the moment. But what, what you've got to realize is that there is this roadmap, and before we're, we're going to that transition, there will be many transitions b before that. We will probably start introducing new materials into silicon technology first, keeping the CMOS technology there, and then bringing gradually new architecture. That's where this vertical, this vertical uh, heterostructures would uh, would come into play and then later on probably would have to switch to completely new paradigm uh, new uh, new architecture and that's where um, Robert would would uh, would con con contribute because it's a completely different um, uh, different mindset of, of computing okay well let's speak a little bit about that the mindset uh is completely different mm -hmm. in quantum computing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how people who don't get that can wrap their heads around it. Yeah, I can try. So, um, yeah, as you were saying, uh, as they keep shrinking down uh, today's circuits, they're getting smaller and smaller, and they're approaching the atomic scale. And sort of conventional chip makers and electrical engineers look at that and say, oh, this is, this is a problem. The, the rules are changing, and the, the way we understand our circuits are, are breaking down. And uh, what we're trying to do in quantum computing is say, oh, uh, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, let's accept that things uh, may change. And if we kind of go to a different paradigm, let's not have uh, a circuit which behaves in the ordinary way that electrical engineers and so on are trained, but is explicitly quantum in some sense. Uh, then we can process information and do computing tasks and so on in a, in a kind of new way. And quantum is giving you what properties <coughs> that traditional computers don't possess. Right. Well, so in a, in a traditional computer, uh, you represent the information as bits. And the, the bits are always supposed to be 0 or 1. They're never supposed to change on you. They're never supposed to be in an undefined state in between 0 and 1. Uh, the basic paradigm of quantum computing is to say, well, we'll replace that with a quantum bit. We call them qubits. And, uh, the quantum bit has, let's say, two energy levels, like an atom, uh, which we'll call 0 and 1. But then we can manipulate that in different ways. And we can make new states of that quantum bit. So we can put it in a superposition, which is both the 0 and the 1 at the same time. And that sounds maybe, at first glance, like a bad thing. Now we don't know what the information is that we've stored. But actually, a superposition is not just a random thing where you don't know if it's 0 or 1. It's really, in according to the rules of quantum mechanics, both representing the 0 and the 1 at the same time. And you know, eventually, then, the idea, mathematically, you can show is that uh, this allows the computer, in some sense, to explore many different possibilities, many permutations or uh, branches that the calculation you're doing could have taken, uh, but all at the same time. We were talking earlier, you use um, fairly traditional materials to create the Q bits that, or to create the, the entities that will hold the quantum information, is, is it, can you see a connection between new materials? I mean, may, might that offer, solve some of the technological hurdles that you face, or are you still facing mathematical hurdles? Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, I'm an experimentalist, and so there are lots and lots of practical challenges in, in trying to realize a, a useful quantum computer. Uh, and absolutely, there are many materials challenges that we face and many things where new materials could really uh, be the enabling key, key thing. Um, but 
I guess we use, in our research at Yale, uh, fairly conventional materials. We use silicon or uh, sapphire uh, chips and uh, uh, metallic structures composed of aluminum. Um, but we're operating them under sort of exotic conditions, extreme conditions near absolute zero, where all the metals are superconducting. And then we can make uh, circuits where the things an electrical engineer usually works with, like current and voltage, are actually quantum objects that need to be described uh, with the rules that are usually applied to single atoms. All right. So, Kasia, do you have to also use exotic states to make your materials, or do they exist in more normal, you know, uh, temperature and pressure? Well, we, we just, we, they exist in normal temperature and pressure, although we always like to keep them at uh, at same extreme conditions go to very low temperature, then it's it's much easier to understand what is going on. But just to 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 add to what Robert said, one of the um, reason uh, and one of the tasks to if you try to work uh, with quantum computations is to create um, is to create, for example, topologically protected states for so the quantum information can be transferred and manipulated and that's one of the um, one one of the most exciting topic over the last maybe five years or so we start finding those materials where we can create those topologically protected states and uh, heterostructures which I mentioned they also allowed allow to, to create those states so for um, part of my job is, of course, to think about p possible applications, but what really excites me most is to find those new uh, quantum states of matter. So, who, I mean, so who is sufficiently interested in this question to give you money to try to solve it? Well, um, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um, you, would be, you would be surprised, but even electronic companies, I won't be able, probably, I won't be comfortable to talk about, to, no, to give you names, but very large uh, electronic corporations are interested in those, uh, in those uh, new architectures. So we're not talking, so we're, we're talking uh, medium time horizon uh, beyond five, seven years, but not 20 years, which might be 20, 15, 20 years, which might be the quantum computation. So the the, the horizon about 10, 15 years, and um, one of the outcome of, of our research on the heterostructures was a new type of transistors, tunneling transistors, and apparently uh, several um, several big corporations working in around electronics are interested. In, in those and we and we work closely with them. So this, I mean, they're looking to solve the. They're looking to the future of these sort of standard uh, electronic uh, devices, but to take them into the next generation to make them faster, less energy consumption, things like that. Well, I won't say that there is that currently there is panic and then that we don't know that they don't know how to how how to proceed, but they need to build start building the roadmap for, for the next 10 years and they know that they want to and, and of course as you uh, try to look further and further into the future you've got more and more possible opportunities so one of the opportunity they try to they, so this is one of the possible opportunities now. right so rob you said that um uh one of the well there there is a similar curve uh, in terms of the uh, speed at which the problem facing quantum computing is being solved, <laughs> the Sholkov curve. <laughs> Maybe you can talk a little bit about what, where we are in terms of, you said we're moving from a period of a theoretical possibility into a period where quantum computing can actually begin to, you can begin to think of it as being possible to scale up and use in a, in a right. real device. Yeah, so, I mean, actually the sort of theoretical origins of uh, quantum computing and so on were in the uh, 1980s and 90s, and it was, uh, became a very popular topic in around 1994, 95 with the discovery of 
this factorization algorithm by Peter Shor. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I think the field is evolving, and uh, things are moving more quickly than than we had thought at some point. So, I guess uh, five years ago, you know, I was saying, and people like myself were saying, "Oh, I think it's 30 years away from from uh, reality or from applications." And uh, today, I'm saying it's maybe 10 years or 15 years away, and uh, and so you know, I think uh, things are accelerating. So. Uh, now, in terms of the, the Sholkoff's law, um, <clears throat> there are sort of two main branches of technology that people are investigating for quantum computing. One is to use microscopic systems like single atoms or single impurities in, in a semiconductor or things like that, which are very microscopic. Uh, and then there's another approach, which is what we specialize in, that's sort of making relatively large uh, uh, circuits and devices that uh, can still be coaxed into being uh, explicitly quantum mechanical and, and serve as quantum bits. And for the two approaches, they're sort of two different basic problems that were faced at the outset. So for a single atom or these microscopic devices, it was understood what their quantum mechanics was and that, of course, they could serve as a quantum bit. What was much less understood is how you would couple them together and connect them up into something you would imagine could process information and, and do a computation. Now, for our approach with the larger devices, we can make many, many of them, and we can array them in very complicated ways. The question there was, well, are they ever really going to be quantum enough? Will they uh, actually serve as quantum bits? And so uh, the place where we've seen the biggest progress is not, we haven't yet hit a Moore's law where the number of quantum bits in everyone's experiments around the world is doubling every 18 months. Mm -hmm. But for example, with our technology, uh, the lifetime over which our qubit will stay in the state we need it to be in without forgetting uh, has improved tenfold every two, three years. And so it's now reaching a point where we think that's enough to let us go forward. But are you in a place where you have some uh, uh, conceptual uh, hurdle that has to be cleared? Or are you at a place where you can tweak the parameters that you're currently working under and hope to get to the desired outcome? Yeah, so I think what uh, we find very exciting is right now with our devices, we really believe we can build things of a complexity that's never really been done in quantum mechanics or in, in quantum information processing. Uh, to go to the really large scale that would you know, help people solve computational problems, there are still issues that need to be uh, understood better and, and conquered. One of the biggest ones is something called quantum error correction, which is sort of a way of keeping the computer on track so that just one error doesn't take it uh, to a completely wrong answer. Uh, and that's something which, again, there's some mathematical understanding of, but the practicalities of how you achieve that and how hard it's going to be to uh, implement that uh, in necessary function before you can scale up, um, those are really the sort of science challenges we think we need to tackle in the next five years. Right. What is the Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Current state of uh, of of art is there an alternative to JSON qubits in, in terms of scaling up? Sure. I mean, uh, as a flip answer, I sometimes now say that you know at, there are as many p possible qubits or proposed qubits as there are quantum systems that people know about. Um, but uh, so, I mean, some of the leading things are quantum dots in semiconductors, uh, where you can confine one or two electrons uh, using some wires on a on a chip. Uh, there are things like uh, NV centers, nitrogen uh, impurities in diamond. Uh, there are also these interesting ideas about using novel materials, like you were saying, to realize Majorana or fermions or uh, other they, kinds of things. But those haven't been shown to be scalable yet. Uh, they've not been shown to be scalable. In some cases, we're still looking to really demonstrate the basic physics that this, this approach uh, would rely on. So I mean, they're very interesting. Uh, pieces of fundamental physics that people are discovering all along, and that's the thing that initially drew us to the problem. Uh, but you know, I think uh, uh, no one should say that they know everything they need to do in order to scale up yet. But I think the idea is that there are going to be a few approaches that will be able to move forward in the, in the near future. I just want to remind people that um, if you do happen to be watching and have a question that you'd like to have us ask, have me ask, um, send a would tweet using that hashtag Moore's Law, even though we're not talking about Moore's Law, you can still use it and we will capture it and it will be sent to me and I'll be able to ask the question. 
Kostya, when um, you said that 10 years ago, the, the, the things you're working on didn't probably weren't even considered possible. Well, the point is it's a, it's a relatively new field. Are you in a position now where you're simply just there's everything every day. There's something new to learn about what the properties are of these crystals, or have you moved into another uh, stage where you've begun to understand enough about them to predict? Okay, this is what's going to happen if we do that or do this manipulation with them. Well, um, first, uh, yeah. So uh, the the systems with which, which, which we started to work uh, was ten years ago. Graphene has quite a large number of the unique properties. Mm -hmm. the, the, the good thing is that lots of uh, physicists around the, the world found it interesting. So we tackled uh, this problem quite fast, I would say, and we've got very robust understanding on what is going on there. Um, however, still every now and then we can uh, we're, we're coming across new properties and, and new uh, and new phenomena which are extremely exciting. Now, as I said, there is a whole class of those materials which are only one atom thick, and uh, from our experience with 3D objects, it's not it's not always possible to predict what what can you expect from those uh, one atom thick materials. You can try to think about it and, and you try to calculate, but uh, sometimes it's, it's easier to, 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 to measure, in fact. And also there are a large number of those, of those materials as well. To predict which one would be most exciting, uh, well, it, it depends, first of all, on your, on your field. I, I mentioned superconductivity is very interesting in, in two dimensions, ferromagnetism. But um, but also uh, you can uh, but <coughs> also sometimes it's very hard to predict what are you going to find in those in those crystals. Mm -hmm. Is there is there one that you're particularly interested in? You said that they're depending on your application, but but you're more interested in the materials themselves. So is there something well, that got you um, very excited right I'm, now? No, I'm I'm not material scientist myself, and uh, the uh, exciting part for me is to create structures where we can uh, put our hands on the quantum properties of electrons or quasi particles there. And there are certain types of, of, of heterostructures which I would like to do and which I'm, which I'm very excited about. Some of them are maybe related to what Robert is studying, like um, decomposing a cuper. Cuper pair into uh, into two 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 coherent electrons, and but there are quite a few of those of those structures. Okay, well, I said I'd be happy to take questions from the audience, and if anybody has one or wants to think of one, I can ask a question or two more, and then you can go. Or if somebody has a question right now, feel free. There is on, on your right. Yes. Thank you so much for that incredible information and the innovation that you're driving in the work that you're doing. My question is time to market. Um, given you know, sort of Moore's law of market, how are you seeing the time cycles shrinking from your research to getting into our ever shrinking hands? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and what is the interest in the work that you are doing and or who is helping both accelerate and amplify the work that you are doing? Um, let me probably start on this. Sure. sure. Uh, well, first of all, there are rules of physics with which we are very comfortable usually. So we, we, sometimes you can be disappointed that you cannot raise the TC of a superconductor much higher, but we are comfortable with it at least. And there are rules of economics with which we're really uh, struggling. And um, I can tell you the, um, uh, the time life of any discovery of, uh, I, of any new technique, either the new materials like graphene or many others, or uh, I, I can even try to predict what's going to, to happen with the quantum computations which uh, Robert is, is trying to, to do first. 
uh, it would be very naive to expect that uh, those electronic operations would jump and try to implement those <laughs> techniques into the front end uh, devices, into front end um, uh, microprocessors. What will happen is first you would see uh, individual transistors based on that uh, or another technology, then probably incorporate them as. Um, uh, as uh, devices for telecommunications where single <coughs> single transistors would work or a single modulator would work. As we do it, we learn more about the stability of those new materials or those new technologies. You develop the uh, new technologies and then you will be ready to, to incorporate it into the front, uh, into, into front end uh, devices. Same will probably happen with the quantum information. First, before seeing, um, seeing uh, quantum computers, well, we have already a quantum computer and you, I will probably smart. challenge you to tell us more about that <laughs> one, but, <laughs> but uh, you will probably see more of quantum technology <coughs> in telecommunications and then as we, as we, as we use it there, we would uh, learn more about that and then at a certain moment we will get ready to, 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 to put it into, uh, into a final device. So you won't see just an abrupt change and mm -hmm. an abrupt threshold. So it will be a gradual introduction of new materials, new technology into, into our life. Yeah, I, I think I would, uh, I would agree with uh, everything Kostya said. So um, it, there's, there's quantum computing and there's quantum information in general, right? So uh, a full-blown quantum computer uh, that outperforms uh, any conventional computer is never, I think, going to end up in some future version of your phone. It's more likely to be a very specialized thing uh, that scientists use or that exists in the cloud somewhere and you access. Uh, but indeed, there are things such as uh, protocols for doing secure communication and so on, and there are some small versions of these available commercially already. Okay, So I, I think there will be some uh, uh, gradual transition as well. But, um, you know, I think... Uh, uh, people have been predicting the end of Moore's law and that it's always 10 years away for the 50 years that it's been around. So it's maybe a dangerous thing to bet against it. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, nonetheless, I think uh, in that industry, right, you, you have a couple of things you have to do. You have to make sure that your next uh, fabrication plant two years from now is also producing things that are twice as good like everybody else. Uh, and there's a path that they follow for those timescale kind of innovations, but they also need to look at, you know, what's coming ahead uh, a decade away or so. And so I think kind of at least for, for our field, we're maybe in a transition period where I think we're going to start to see more private sector funding and, and interest from, from industry and things. Yes. Uh, I'm interested from Constantina. Um, do you look at the effects of gravity on what you're doing? Are you interested in that? Are you interested in doing something in, in space and seeing what, you know, well, since there's such a business between the <coughs> quantum and the gravity? Um, it's, it would be quite a challenging experiment to do, but um, one of the possible experiments you can imagine, you can uh, create a, 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 the thinnest possible mem membrane which is and you can use it uh, as um, uh, as the finest possible balance so you can measure masses using using the resonance on, on this on, the, on this membrane uh, whether you would be able to <coughs> to, to catch gravitation I think there are even even pub publications which which propose, uh, square square kilometers of graphene and trying to catch um, gravitational waves with that. So I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not really following that 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 literature. But um, something where uh, which which would link elastic properties and the possibility to measure really fine fine masses uh, with 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 graphene membranes would be ex extremely exciting. Um, I have a question from. The Twitterverse. Um, it says, uh, it's question seven, if you want to put it up. It says, uh, graphene has a 
plenty of non-electronic related applications are those nearer term. That's very much true and uh, yes probably uh, or uh, electronic relation uh, electronic related applications which are not in the front end com computing but in printed electronics. So uh, graphene is indeed extremely strong material and very uh, elastic and uh, pe people already start to use it as a, um, um, as a uh, reinforcer for uh, for plastics for for composite materials, it's it's already been uh, be, being used, and you can buy products uh, mm -hmm. where graphene is, is being used. Um, it has extremely good thermal conductivity properties, and that's another problem which we are facing. So probably one of the biggest issues is not even the miniaturization of, of our transistors, but really the heat dissipation. And uh, as a heat conductor or a, or a heat, heat spreader, the uh, paste which are based on, or, or, on graphene are being explored now, and, and there are quite a few of those. Printed electronics is extremely exciting and probably much more near term than, uh, than, than the front-end computing. Okay. Do you have a question? Yes. Microphone. Do you already have an idea uh, what your research uh, may mean to manufacturing technology? Because today's leading edge Silicon wafer fabs costs billion of dollars. Can you change this game? <laughs> right. We are, as I said, there are people are looking forward like ten years ahead, and there are research for new materials and for new architectures, and of course, uh, three five material like gallium arsenide and and uh, indium gallium arsenide are, are, are being ex uh, explored extremely uh, broadly graphene and many of the of other two dimensional uh, semi metals and semiconductors are being uh, are being started so uh, we work closely with industry they are aware of the of the of the possibilities and they are they are researching into it yes, there's a question there No. Go ahead. We'll have time. We'll have time. Um, I've read press accounts of, of quantum computers apparently in commercial operation or semi-commercial operation, and um, but there seems to be a lot of controversy about benchmarking these, about whether they're actually computationally efficient. So I was curious why it's so complicated to find out whether something's being done better or not with these devices, or, or whether they even exist, or this is a fiction of the press. <laughs> well, okay. So there may be several ingredients in your question. Um, uh, I mean, the first thing is, even if when you looked at uh, uh, the early days of original computing, uh, as soon as people could build the hardware, it was not immediately uh, apparent what you should do with it, how you would, you know, the science of programming had to be developed uh, once people actually had uh, uh, the hardware. So uh, we don't know that much yet about uh, the applications of quantum computing and how you should program <coughs> it. And so one interesting thing that's coming out of this uh, this topic and uh, and these machines that are coming forward is sort of you know let's say someone let's say I claim I've built a quantum computer and I hand it to you what are the tests you do to it to see that I'm not pulling your leg right um, uh, and so I think uh, a good part of this debate that's going on right now is we're doing the first steps in figuring out what it takes to validate the performance of some quantum enabled device so there there are some uh, companies out there now, and uh, uh, one in particular uh, is is promoting some hardware which uh, they sometimes describe as a quantum computer, but is a little bit different than the quantum computer that uh, myself and, and my colleagues are working on. Uh, roughly, theirs is sort of an analog computer that is doing a quantum annealing kind of uh, thing, if you know what that means. But uh, it's basically a, yet another paradigm where quantum mechanics may help in solving certain kinds of problems, but there's less, I think, known about, you know, what you really need to show in your hardware to convince someone that, that it's useful. Um, so, you know, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, these are going to be questions that will come up more and more as time goes on. Thank you. You've got the microphone going that way. Thank you. I, um, I, 
I came here to learn something completely new. I'm totally out of my depth. I've probably understood about 5% of what you've said. Um, well, that's good. But um, that's no criticism of you. It's, it's a comment on my own ignorance. But um, I found it absolutely mind-blowing, really fascinating. Um, I want to be able to go home and explain to my nine-year-old grandson what he might be able to do when he's 25 as a result of what you're talking about that a 25-year-old couldn't do now. Is there any, any, could, you, could you give me some insight into what that would look like? <clears throat> okay, so I'll, I'll mm. probably talk if well. If you can well, think of something well. to start, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think what uh, becomes more and more evident now that we start to use more and more materials in our, uh, in our technology. Say, 20 years ago, silicon fabs would, would, would use maybe 10 of different elements. Now it's half of the periodic table is now. But we're going much, 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 much beyond that. New materials are being, are being utilized uh, as uh, in, in, modern, in, in modern electronics. And even your mobile phones would have very uh, electronics which are based on very uh, different materials, not only on silicon. So this, this trend will probably continue and we will see that uh, <coughs> materials on demand or de designing new materials being more and more important and depending on the particular, uh, on the particular application, on the particular I don't know, frequency you want your transistor to, to operate, we will be able to uh, to, to compute and predict a, a new material and try to to produce it as well, so that's the that's one of one of the general trends that we'll we'll, we'll start start using more materials, much more much more new materials than we're using now. Yeah, I think uh, I might turn it around. So I'd say, you know, uh, we hope we can't actually predict what's going to happen in 25 years. And if you look back, right, I mean, computing and information technology 25 years ago, we, uh, you know, we still were just beginning to have a lot of the things that everyone takes for granted now, like email and e-commerce and uh, the internet and so on. So, uh, you know, whether it's quantum computing or new materials or whatever, I think uh, in 25 years, the way uh, modern technology is going the way information technology in particular is moving, uh, it should be very, very difficult to predict. But I, I would hope that, you know, uh, you know, if you had brought uh, your iPhone back to someone 25 years ago, he would have, you know, called you a wizard and, you know, said, how did you get this supercomputer? So, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, unless there's really uh, a shocking turn of events and everyone runs out of good ideas, which I really doubt, um, I think we'll have a similar uh, kind of feeling looking back from now, 25 years from hence. So. Yeah. First of all, I just want to uh, note that it's great to have a compatriot and a fellow Yaley on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my question is about this. So for me, all of this is very new. And uh, what, what else should I be looking at at the most exciting things happening <coughs> in physics, in computing in general? Uh, either now or, or in the future. So what are the other breakthrough ideas that perhaps should be on the horizon of all of us? <laughs> yeah, as just been mentioned, the, the most interesting things are those which you cannot predict. So it's, um, I can accurately predict the past, not, not, not the, uh, the future. <laughs> but, um, but generally, yes, the uh, quantum state of matter is 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 a big trend in in, uh, in physics, and that's I think it, it will continue. Uh, I can say something I learned just yesterday. So I mean, uh, uh, I was in a different session where uh, someone was talking about the capabilities of electronics and modern computing uh, being applied to trying to understand the brain. And so you know, I think one one hope also in this whole area is that maybe. Uh, quantum information or maybe uh, understanding better how the brain works will tell us just different ways that we can go about solving the problems that face us, so. Well, uh, th this, I mean, I'm still, I've, I've been listening to this discussion myself and trying to think, how do I sum this up? <laughs> <laughs> and how do, I, how do I lay out for you the future and the direction that this is taking us? And I, and I think it's actually quite, quite interesting. I think this idea that we really don't know but the fact that smart people are really paying a lot of attention to these two topics 
I mean, two areas, suggests to me that there's something important there. And maybe they're wrong, and in, in 20 years we'll say, well, that was a dead end, but I don't think so. And so uh, I, I would encourage everybody just to pay attention and keep, keep an eye out and, and, and expect the unexpected, maybe that's the way to put it. But anyway, uh, thank you all for coming, and thank the panel for their great presentation. Thank you.